For those of you who are joining us for the first time, thanks for coming out to hear the rest of our speakers. Um, today has been full of wonderful speakers and we've learned a lot of great things. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is Dr. Tyrone Hayes. Um, Dr. Hayes is a professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Hayes earned his BA in Organismic and Evolutionary Biology from Harvard University and a PhD in Integrative Biology from UC Berkeley. He held a postdoctoral position at the National Institutes of Health and Cancer Research before becoming an assistant professor at Berkeley. In 2000, Dr. Hayes became the youngest faculty member to receive full professorship and tenure at Berkeley. His work focuses on the effects of steroid hormones for amphibian development and conducts both laboratory and field studies in the U.S. and Africa. He is interested in metamorphosis and sex differentiation of amphibians, as well as larval and adult growth and hormonal regulation of aggressive behavior. Um, uh, Dr. Hayes' work addresses questions on ecological, organismal, and molecular levels, and most notably, his work on the effect of the pesticide uh, atrazine on amphibian reproduction has gained widespread attention. He has trained over 60 students in his lab. He has published, published over 80 peer-reviewed articles. He is a reviewer for nine professional journals, and he has given well over 300 um, symposium and seminars. He mentioned earlier that he travels and gives at least 50 talks a year. So we're re really fortunate to have him come this year. And so here he is. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for your hospitality. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Um, before I tell my story, I have a little ritual that I always go through. Um, I learned this phrase in Zimbabwe, which loosely means people are people through other people. And so I never give a talk or any kind of presentation without thanking people who made me who I am, the people who are responsible for me being here. Uh, first and foremost is my family. It's an old photo, they won't let me be in them anymore, but <laughs> they're all important, but of course we're biologists. Special thanks to my mom and dad, Romeo and Susie Hayes. I wouldn't be here without them for obvious reasons. And also to my wife, Catherine Kim, um, for her love and support. Without her, my kids, Tyler and Cassina, wouldn't be here. And, and I'd like to share this photo. This is also an old photo, but it's a special meaning. These are prom pictures, junior prom pictures, and, and it exemplifies how important family is to me. For example, I'm not sure which made me proud of that. My son borrowed my tie for his prom. I let my daughter borrow my earrings for it. <laughs> <laughs> I get this notice, we're wearing the same ones. After 18 years of being told, no, oh, daddy's earrings are too grown up for you, she, she finally got to sport them. And anyway, equally, equally proud. Proud of that. Uh, I want to thank the funding sources. It takes, as you heard earlier today, it takes money to do work. And I also, this is a matter of disclosure, I have been funded by the chemical industry, but they've since decided that they don't like hanging out with me anymore. Well, that's okay. I want to thank all the students that have been involved. I'm going to tell you a story that's ongoing for about 20 years. And I want to point out that everybody in blue is an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself. And most of the work that I'll talk to you about has been done by undergraduates. I've been doing my best to try to give back to them what was given to me now that I'm in a place to do that. This is my current lab. There is one dude, but he didn't show up for the photo. And in addition to working with undergraduates, I'm ex ex especially excited also to be working with such a broad group of, of diverse students. Um, and finally, I want to dedicate this to my grandmother who, in addition to passing on her love of teaching and her desire to make the world a better place before she passed on, she taught me something that you can't learn at Harvard or Berkeley or any institution for that matter. She taught me that if you want to get information across, just tell a good story. So I apologize. I don't give talks anymore. I don't give lectures. I don't preach. I don't teach. I just want to tell you a story. And my story will start and end with a little boy who likes frogs. This is a book that my mom sent me when my son was born. I always start with this book. When my son was born, she sent this book and she wrote a note in there and said, this was your dad's favorite book. I don't remember the book, but my mama don't lie. What I remember is that I've been in love with amphibians and, and really answering this question, what is a frog, for all of my life. And it's led me as a little boy who likes frogs to 
some unpredictable places. I'm going to go back to my grandmother for a minute as we get into the story, because a lot of it starts here. That's her house, was her house. It's a plywood, tin roof house. Her grandfather built that house. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. And when my grandmother died, she was still living in that house. And in that house was still the bill of sale for my grandmother's grandmother. When her grandfather purchased the property and the woman who became his wife and my grandmother's grandmother. So a lot of history in that house. The other thing that was important about this house is there was a huge forest behind the house. And I just read somewhere that the two biggest stretches of forest left in the Amazon and the Congo. And we're really in trouble. But at least in terms of my life, this huge stretch of forest behind our house was incredibly important because I got lost there for hours chasing snakes and filming birds and chasing frogs. And, and on Google Earth, I'm like, I can show you that forest. Let me just, there it is. There's the little house. The cemetery was always there, the highway was there, the horse path. It was this tiny, tiny thing. But in my memory, it was this vast, vast forest that I got lost in for hours. And the important thing is, in that forest, I got to witness things like this. And now some of you may not know about this wonderfulness of amphibians and these behaviors that they do. For example, in altruism. So, so this frog, for example, has, has hurt its leg. And, and the one on the bottom is nice enough to give it a ride home. That's just one of the many things that makes these animals great. Now, I can tell an appropriate joke about what happens when you help out a friend. I'll let you figure out the punchline. But they lay these snakes on the way home. And what's important about these guys is they lay these snakes, and there's about 2,000 eggs in each one of these clumps, but hundreds of females might lay their eggs in this, in this one communal clump. And what I became interested in is how does this behavior and this ecology affect the development of how it has evolved. So for example, the, the animals in the middle, the eggs in the middle, can be as much as 10 degrees warmer than the eggs on the edge. That means they might metamorphose faster, they might grow faster. That means that they might have a different sex ratio because in some ectotherms, temperature can affect whether or not you become a male or a female. And this became particularly interesting to me. So I studied, so here's some dissected testes, on top of the kidney, here's some ovaries. So I studied the sex ratio in the species and in animals raised at different temperatures. And I was also interested in the boundaries that the genes might put on what the environment can do or not do. So I looked for sex chromosomes, that there might be genes that also affect whether or not you become male or female. Now I told you I'm going to tell you a story, and I want to, I want to catch you up now on where we're at in the story. We're at my undergraduate days in Harvard, back from 1989. For example, you look at this, you might be thinking, gee, what's up with the raggedy slide? This is back, young people, when cut and paste literally went cut and paste. This is before you go get Photoshop. This is when you had to cut it out, paste it on the page. That's why they call it cut and paste. And this was work for my undergraduate thesis. Here I am at age 19. There's Bruce Waldman, who was my professor. I would not have finished Harvard without this man and my wife and their support. And, and there's Laura, who I'm guessing went on to do something else because she doesn't quite look as excited as I was to. Be in a swamp at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but it was like a dream come true for me. Another thing that was a dream, dream come true, but not until I got to graduate school, was working in Africa. As a kid, I used to sit in this upholstered chair that we had in my, in my room, this little leopard chair, leopard skin cover, fake leopard skin cover chair. <laughs> and I would fold out the pages of National Geographic, and I would dream of going to this magical place of going to Africa. And it was Truly a dream. My father made $9,000 a year for a family of five. First time I ever got on an airplane was when I went to college. So it was completely out of the realm of possibility that, that this would ever happen in my life. And I got to do that in graduate school. And not only did I get to wear this beard, but I got to do that in graduate school. And not only did I get to go to Africa, National Geographic paid for it. I got to be in the magazine, I got to be on the show, I got to be in a Toyota commercial. Look it up, I wouldn't make this thing. So I literally, in the truest sense of the word, I literally became this guy that I dreamed about when I was a little kid. It was truly a dream come true. And I worked in Africa in a place called the Arabuka Sukoke on the coast. And one of the cool things about working in Africa, of course, is you get the same words like Arabuka Sukoke. <laughs> and so I started working in Arabuka Sukoke, and I got introduced to the species, High Corleus Argus, where the males and females, you just heard about one sexually dichromatic frog, Paraglimis, and here are the males and females were differently colored. And that, you know, if you're a little boy who likes frogs, this is the kind of thing that just catches your eye. So I brought some of these guys back. And 
And then we had Adobe Photoshop. See, so look at that cut and job. That's pretty cool. <laughs> this is the same animal photograph once a day for six days. And I became interested in why they're differently colored, ecologically, developmentally, the whole thing. And we hypothesized that this color change was regulated by estrogen. And that hypothesis was based on the fact that they all start out green. And we were the first to discover this. They all start out green, whether or not you're male or female. And then the females change color as sexual maturity or puberty. So we hypothesized that estrogen regulated this color change. So for example, for the same reason that little girls grow breasts when they reach puberty because estrogen stimulates the development of the breast, we hypothesized that similarly estrogen would stimulate this color change. And then we did some really simple experiments. And, you know, we call genes and do PCR and stuff, but sometimes the answers to a question is simple. We just dip them in hormone. And if you dip them in testosterone, they don't change color, but if you dip them in an estrogen, like estradiol, they develop these spots and they'll change color into female coloration prematurely, or even if they're a male. Okay, now the story gets weird. Even if it's not already. I was at UC Davis giving a talk on my color changing frog, and my wife was February 15th, actually 1993. And I remember the date because it's the day before my son was born. And I'm at UC Davis giving this talk on high girl is artist, and my wife goes to the labor, that's why I remember the day. She's in the audience. And so we're driving back down the highway to Oakland where my son was born, and my wife says, between contractions, you should patent that frog. I thought it was the crazy hormones talking or something. I said, you can't patent the frog. And then her brother-in-law saw her brother and her brother, and he said, oh yeah, you can patent the frog. Here's your 40 because he's a lawyer, right? And so we did. They called it the hyperlist artist endocrine screen or the ACS. <laughs> and the idea was that we would patent this frog, and, and then we would, we would set up a shop and like make some money on the side. And here's, here's why you patent the frog and how you make the money. Here's a control. They all start out green, as they say. If you expose these animals to estradiol, the natural estrogen that's in every vertebrate, sexually mature female, doesn't matter if you're a frog, dog, cat, hog, or human, if you're a reproductively mature female, this hormone circulates in your body. If you give them ethanol estradiol, <clears throat> the synthetic estrogen used in birth control pill will change color. If you give them DES, pharmaceutical estrogen, they'll change color. If you give them DDT, an insecticide that binds to the estrogen receptor, they'll change color. And so we discovered, an undergraduate and a graduate student and I, we screened dozens of compounds, and we discovered that every estrogen, every compound that was estrogen in my frog was also known to promote breast cancer. So that's why you pack the little frog. We also discovered that we could give our frog tamoxifen, an estrogen blocker used to treat breast cancer, that we could stop them from changing color. So not only could we screen compounds of water, right? You could send me a sample of water, dip my frog in, if it changed color, I'd be like, hey, you might not want to drink the water. But we could also potentially pre-screen compounds that might go on to be tested for treatment of breast cancer. So again, we do a little something on the side. My wife had an MBA and an MPH. Thought we'd set up a little contract lab or something. Well, then a little boy who likes frogs, an assistant professor at the time, a little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to some grown-up words, like intellectual property. Yeah, grown-up words tend to come like two at a time. Intellectual <laughs> property. Because the university says, yeah, that's a good idea. But if you don't make money on it, we're going to sell it to somebody else. And they're going to sell my idea. Wow, that's a result. So then I got introduced to this little company called Novartis, the largest chemical company in the world. And they said, we want you to study atrazine. I never heard of atrazine. Now you Google my name, you get atrazine, you Google atrazine, you get me as I would join it at Carbon Bond. <laughs> <laughs> it's an herbicide, a weed killer. Mostly used on corn in this country. It's been used since 1958. And we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States. Still. It's used in more than 80 countries. Actually, I should say 60 now. Because now it's outlawed in all of Europe. And now let me give you a correction record. Yeah. It's not outlawed in all of Europe. According to the company's lawyers, it has been denied regulatory approval by the, regular, by the European Union. The point is, though, is that the company is based in Switzerland. So we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's not allowed in the continent that the company calls home. For some reason, they want me to rephrase it to say it has been denied regulatory approval. I don't know what the difference is, but I know this one pisses them off. So that's the slide that I keep. Because that's just the kind of brother I am, you know? So it turns out they asked us to use another African frog, which you heard a little bit about today, the African clawed frog, Zinibus. Who's, who's heard of it? Cinnabis before today. Yeah, everybody uses cinnabis. And who, who knows what part of my story got given away today? Oh. 
Yes, thanks. That's okay. The reason that they use Xenopus is that in 1920, as you heard it earlier today, somebody discovered that the human pregnancy hormone HCG would make the frog lay eggs. So by 1940, this was the pregnancy test. By 1940, if you thought you were pregnant, you go to the doctor, they inject some urine to the frog, the frog laid eggs, you were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. And now I tell this story for three reasons. One is it shows you the value, not that I have to convince this group, but it shows you the value of curiosity-based research, right? Like, who's the first guy who thought, you know, I wonder what'll happen if I inject pee into a frog. How do you come up with that? Like, I, mean, I don't know where it comes from. The second reason I tell the story is it shows you the similarities between our biology and amphibian biology. In the same way that the estrogens that cause my frog to change color will also promote breast cancer, the human pregnancy hormone is so similar to this frog's hormones that it'll make this frog lay eggs. So as I tell you the story about what atrazine and other pesticides do to frogs and frog hormones, you should be thinking, well, what might it do to me? That's just as a tale of two to men. The third reason I tell the story is after they developed new pregnancy tests, people just threw these frogs out. So I don't have to pay for them. I can drive to San Diego and San Francisco and collect feral African clawed frogs, which I think technically makes them African-American clawed frogs. But that's the point of the story. <laughs> the ones that I use. It's the point of the story that's not all around. So we discovered that atrazine inhibited the growth, voice, uh, growth of the voice box of the larynx in males. And I was on the contract with the company at the time. And this is sort of bad news because male frogs sing and have a bigger larynx and deeper voice than females for the same reason that men have deeper voices than women, testosterone. So these data imply that testosterone levels were impacted. So if your testosterone ain't right, as we say in the business, you look at the gonads, because that's where the testosterone comes from. So here are the kidneys of an exposed animal, and we just wanted to check what was going on. Well, they had testes, so if you're a male, it's good to have a pair. But then they had, this guy has ovaries, then he's got another testes, then he's got an ovary. This guy can hurt his leg and give himself a ride home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which is not normal. And that's not, a, that's not a judgment problem or anything. That's just saying the stuff you learn. So I learned how people think frogs are never did it because of Jurassic Park. The stuff you learn in Jurassic Park is science fiction, not science. Frogs are not hermaphrodites. There are fish, some fish, that are naturally hermaphroditic, not frogs. So we made a hypothesis, and we had some evidence to support it, and I'll show you what we came up with. So imagine that this is your that this is your testicle. Or imagine somebody you don't like, because we're going to do some stuff here. The test that should make testosterone. In fact, this word, uh, this word is one of those words that get stuck together. I forgot what it's called. What's it called? There's a word for it. Anyway, I can't remember. But it's, it means testicular hormone. It's two words stuck together. It's like smoke and fog, you get smog, twist and jerk, you get twerk. It's two words stuck together. Testicular hormone, testosterone, which you should make as a male. If you're supposed to atrazine, we propose that it turned on the enzyme, aromatase. Remember aromatase if you don't know it. We're going to talk about it a while. It's the machinery, if you will, that converts testosterone into estrogen. Another one of those words is stuck together. Estrogen means the generator of estrogen, so estrogen. As a result, and it's a little more complicated than this, but as a result, your testosterone is diminished. So your voice box, for example, won't grow and other things. And you're also subsequently feminized because now you're making estrogen, which is great if you're a female, maybe not so much if you're a male. All right, so we measure blood levels of testosterone. And, and here's control males. These are actually daytime levels. They get much higher than that. Here's antigen treated males, and, and here's control females. So there was clearly an impact on testosterone production in these exposed males. So then, we publish that. Now let me tell you where I'm at in this story now. Here's a paper. Hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. The company dumped us. They got all upset. We published the paper. And we published the paper at PNAS, Proceedings in National Academy of Sciences. You guys know PNAS? My mom. My mom does it. So they call up my mom. And, and just so you know, I'm coming up for tenure right now. That's, that's where we are in the story. So I called my mom, I'm all excited. I said, Mom, for paper coming out, PNAS. Silence. My mom picks up the phone. I said, Mom, she says, yes, son, I heard you. I'm just trying to figure out how you get a paper cut on your penis. I said, no, no, no. I said, P N. She said, I got to spell it. I need to change it right here. 100% true story. My mom's going to kill me. She called me back the next week. And she says, son, how important was that paper? I said, really important. I'm coming up for tenure. 
She goes, because I went to Barnes and Noble. They never heard of that magazine. <laughs> Had an incredible impact on my life. And I tell this story, I'm going to come back to it at the very end of the talk. So keep that in mind. This is now my most important publication. It's a kid's book written for fifth graders. I didn't write it, but my mom can get it in Barnes and Noble, and people who aren't scientists, young scientists, can read it. That's incredibly important to me, and I'll come back to why in the end. Oh, by the way, there are also four black men in the Latino co author of the paper. It's probably a record for the National Academy. As important as it was for all those reasons that I did get tenure, it didn't answer a lot of questions that were important. For example, we didn't know if the hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. Because as I learned as an undergraduate with all that cut and pasting chromosomes, frogs don't have visible morphological chromosomes, even though they might have sex genes. We had a good idea because if we treated a group of frogs, we might get 50% female, 30% male, 20% hermaphrodite. So we had a good idea of the males growing ovaries and not the other way around. The other thing we didn't know is we didn't know what happens when these animals become adults. Because we just looked at the metamorphs. We didn't grow them up to adulthood. We didn't know if they became males, became females, stayed hermaphrodites. And that sounds like an easy question to answer too, right? Except that it takes these frogs about four to five years to reach sexual maturity. That means you gotta get an undergraduate or graduate student and say, hey, 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 I have an idea for your thesis. And maybe by the time you graduate, we might have data. In fact, it was worse than that. It took like eight years for us, for us to get this done. And here was the answer. I still have the email. If you don't believe this, we eventually published this in PNAS, and the editors, they, they like considered it for the cover, but then they said, no, we don't think people are ready. I'm not joking, and I'll tell you why. So here's what happened. By the time the paper was published, so yeah, we do some PCR. It was, we discovered with some colleagues that there was a gene that only females had, so we could tell who was a male and who was a genetic female. And so, for example, the guy with the hurt leg on top, that real clumsy, who looks like he's smiling, he's a male, and that's his brother. So it turns out about 10% of the exposed males in this particular population completely turn into females. So, for example, you see her, a he, and those are his eggs. He's now a grandmother. Completely turned into females. Now, I could have males turned into females, that's kind of a big deal. I could have published that. But you know, I had tenure. I was in no hurry. I wanted to get the whole story. So I asked, what about the other 90% that didn't turn into females? Are they just normal, completely resistant males? I wanted to know, could they breed? Were they competitive? Were they competent? The problem is, I work a lot with undergraduates. You see, frogs breed in the spring. Apparently, so do undergraduates. So there's all this talk. They want to go away from spring break. It's a pool party thing. You got you to gotta trick them. You got to get them to stay around. So in 2008, I said, look, how about spring break? I give you the pool party. Snoop Dogg won't be there, or Pitbull, or whoever. But I'll give you the pool party if you stay here, and then we'll get a PNAS paper. You guys would do that, right? Yeah. OK, what's something like this? <laughs> this, is, this is true. This is, this is what I call, this is what we in science call an apparatus. So this is my apparatus. So what we did, I just made this up. You know, we put four females in there, four control males, four actually treated males. The guys are like, that's not, that, where's that place we went last night? Black swamp or whatever. The guys are like, that's not the sex ratio you want to be club. But the idea was, we wanted the females to be limited so that the males have to compete. And so we literally, we, we go in at 7 p.m., so we put the guys in there, put on a little Marvin gate, lights goes out. And the next morning, you come back, and you just look at who got the hookup and who didn't, and there's stitches in there so we can tell who's who. And, and when you do that, you find out that the atrazine treated males almost never went. We only had two males, and everybody was a virgin, nobody was tested twice. Only two atrazine treated males ever got the female. Now, I'm an endocrinologist, so here's, I can't just observe things, right? That's what I did as an undergraduate, Bruce Wallman. As a behavior ecologist, you just observe. As an endocrinologist, you know, I have to measure something. So imagine you're at a club. The lights come on, and somebody's going around writing down names about who's who, and then they stick a needle in your heart and take some blood out. That's, that's how this went down. So when you do that, you find out if you measure testosterone, as you might guess, the controls represented in black on average have much more testosterone than the atrazine treated. But what's more is, if you look at the individual data, if you look at who made the love connection, what you find out is that there's kind of a threshold testosterone, and these atrazine treated animals simply don't have enough testosterone to be competitive. Except these two, that one. Okay, so I probably couldn't publish that. But I had a tenure. I was in no hurry. The next thing I wanted to know is, okay, well, they're not competitive, but are they competent? 
So then we did a series of things that I call the Motel 6 experiments. As opposed to the pool party, the Motel 6, you don't have to compete. We just got them in a room and you know, hooked them up, let them spend a couple days together, actually just one day. And then we collect the eggs and measure how many of those eggs are fertile. Now this is a complicated procedure because some eggs, if they're infertile, look like this, and, and, and they can be anywhere from here to here in a few days. And it's a complicated, complicated procedure. There's an undergraduate sitting there going, one, two, three, four. Simple answer sometimes. If you do that, you find out that the atrazine treated animals have very low fertility. Controls fertilize about 85% of their eggs. Atrazine treated males only about 15%. For two reasons. One is the atrazine treated males don't even try. Even though there's no competition, they got a room. They just sit there and watch the females lay eggs. The other reason the following is that, it, you know, listen, it, let me ask you a question. How many people out there like p values? p values. I like a good p-value as much as another brother, right? But what I like even more is when I can see the difference. So these are slices through testes under the microscope. And I can take pictures and pass them out to students and go, put them in two piles. Because what's happened in these controls, let me blow this section up, is here's a testicular tube, you're all full of sperm. See all that dark stuff? Those are soldiers, ready to go. And if you look at this, here's a testicular tube full of cellular debris. Most of the tubules are devoid of sperm. They don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. They don't have enough testosterone to maintain the sperm. And oh, we use the fancy Photoshop procedure to measure the amount of sperm and put a p-value on it. But what's important to me is that you can see, as we say in the business, something ain't right. So then, we were ready to publish another paper. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration. And male African clawed frog, chemical castration. The company hates that term. That's why I put it in the title. Because <laughs> that's the kind of brother I am, you know. But the other thing that was important here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven undergraduates co authored the work, including a Morehouse man. That's important to me. And that question we asked is is this just African clawed frogs? And, you know, maybe it's just a weird thing that happens in one species of frogs. So and the next thing we ask is do you see these effects in other species of frogs? And so we went to the North American leopard frog, a North American frog this time. And, and this is work that ended up in nature. And, and I'm coming up for full professor now, by the way. I'm not saying you need to plan where you publish stuff along your promotion track, but it just might not be. So what we ended up publishing is, this is an individual. See, these are testes. It was exposed to atrazine in the lab. And then you see all this junk in the trunk. These are all eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testes. So it's not a hermaphrodite, but it's making the wrong germ cells. Now, at this time, in addition to coming up for full professor, I'm also interacting with environmental protection agencies. And I broke embargo on a major paper. That's how important I thought this was. I sent the data to the EPA. I said, look, I, I think something's up with this atrazine thing. It ain't, ain't right. And the EPA wrote me back. I still have the email. They wrote me back and they said, well, thank you, Dr. Hayes. This is an interesting finding. However, we do not see it as an adverse effect that would trigger reassessment and possible regulation of the chemical. I don't want to be sexist. Okay. Talk to the guys just for a second. Just for a second. As my wife tells me, and ladies, we're going to give you this. My wife tells me there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. I'm going to give you that. But fellas, are you with me when I say that I think a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle would have to be in the top five? Right? The EPA says, no, that's not an adverse effect. It's great. So the reason we looked at the North American leopard frog anyways is now we wanted to go out. Is this a laboratory artifact? Or is this is a real world thing we need to worry about. So we wanted to know if these effects occur in the wild. And so let me just give you an idea of what we're looking at. We, we saw some stuff about application rates earlier, right? So we're using 0.1 parts per billion. That's 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's 0.1 nanograms per mil. That's 100 picograms per mil, which probably means nothing to any of you. So let me give you a visual. That's about one one thousandth of a grain of salt in two years. 0.1 parts per billion. The package of atrazine recommends application of 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So a typical farmer may be using this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we're using in the laboratory. Okay? But they give you an idea how much is really out there. Here's, this is from the literature now. Minimum and maximum, in agricultural runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, precipitation. Here's what I'm using. Here's all the environments that are at risk. There's enough atrazine in rainwater 
They chemically castrate feminized frogs up to a hundred times more than we're using it. Goes up on dust, gets in the clouds, it can travel a thousand kilometers at 600 miles for the Americans. Half a million pounds of atrazine come out of the rainwater every year. That's a lot. What's more is, here's the drinking water standard, three parts per billion. So on average, you can be in your drinking water at levels that we know to be 30 times higher than what's biologically, what's biologically active. In fact, we have a, I'm sure you have one here too, this Environmental Health and Safety EHS. They wrote me a letter of concern when I start doing the work. They said, what are you gonna do with the wastewater when you do these experiments? And I emailed them back, I said, I'm gonna take it home and drink it. Doesn't guarantee that. See, I, I thought that was funny too. <laughs> Not so much the administration. And anyway, the point was, we went into the field, we did this study, so these are kidneys, this is not an animal from my lab now, these are testes, and I'm gonna do a serial cross-section. So just imagine, if you're not used to this, that I'm slicing up the salami. I'm gonna fold out a slice, as color's different because of the stain we use under the microscope, people always ask me that, I'm gonna blow this up, I'm gonna blow this section up, and you see here, testicular tubules, you can see the outline, but there's no sperm in there, there are eggs in there. I call them testicular oocytes. I made that word up. And the company got upset. The lawyer, they wrote me a letter. They wrote a letter to Nature. They said a paper should be retracted because I made up a word. I said, I'm in the heart I can make up a word. I don't know how to but now everybody got to call it to stick your own site. Because I, the public's not. So, in the study, see, red is what they use mostly after seeing now the gray white. We did this transect. I heard all about transects today. We control for latitude. I'm being obnoxious. This is Highway I 80. I mean, we drive to the herd meetings in Indiana, and we collect the frogs all the way, got the nature pick. See, that's a few efficiency right there. So it turns out every place we found atrazine, we found hermaphrodites and vice versa. But the reason the paper got in nature was not just because we heard correlation, just correlation. It got in the nature because we had the lab data to back up that we could take animals from here and raise them in the lab in clean water, and they would come out without, without hermaphrodites. And we could take animals from here and put them in the lab in atrazine, and they would come out with some aphrodites. So we knew it wasn't just correlation and it wasn't just population variation. There was a hint, a very strong hint, of, of cause and effect. And, and that's why, I, and I, I made it full professor, by the way, not just because of the paper, but you know, because I'm just, I'm a nice guy and stuff all that too. So here's the other thing. The next thing we want to do, and I'm, I'm going to move on from frogs, is we want to know in a landscape like this, because most of the middle of the country looks like this. This is York, Nebraska, and there's a pond right there. And in and, and that pond, they're growing corn there, and the water there has frogs in it. And so we want to know what is, not only does atrazine really occur and have these effects in the wild, which our data suggested, but how important is atrazine to the tadpoles in this water when just on this field alone, you're not only exposed to atrazine, but all these other herbicides, these fungicides, and these insecticides. How important? is atrazine. So we did this study, now you're going to see why it's from the undergraduates, where we looked at all those chemicals alone or in combination, everything was color coded. I used to say it was a double blind study because the students didn't know which treatments were which, but then some psychologists told me, no, double blind means that the people in the study don't know, but the frogs didn't know what they were being treated with, so I'm going to still call it double blind. And so we did this study, and I don't have time to tell you all the details, but we ended up discovering something interesting. Now, when I grabbed the work, I showed that stress hormones can cause immunosuppression, decreased growth, and retarded development. But we showed in this particular study, and again, I don't have time to show you the data that's published in environmental health perspective, that as you give these pesticides, the more pesticides you give, we don't know if the individual nature of the pesticides matter, but the more you give, the more cortisol and stress hormone you get. And then you get these effects that look like high stress effects, like retarded growth and development and, and decreased immune function. So the question then became is, how important is atrazine in testicular oocytes if you're like small can metamorphos and have low high disease um, infection rates? And, and that's a question we're still trying, trying to answer. The next thing we want to do, and again that was published, and this is brand new stuff that's not published, but the next thing we want to do is ask, okay, how important are pesticides when there are other environmental stressors out there? And we did this work in Salinas. Salinas River runs south to north, and there's a huge amount of agriculture the farms there are mostly in the north. Who, who's ever eaten anything from Salinas? Everybody raise your hand. Because 85% of the country's lettuce and salad greens comes out of Salinas. 85%. Just that one crop. So I guarantee you, if you've eaten a vegetable, you've eaten from Salinas. But here's the experiment that's already been done. The top here, where the water flows out, is a dam in Santa Margarita. There's no pesticides, no farms, 
foot and a half deep water, 22 degrees Celsius is a nice place to be a frog. Rich people in Monterey get their water from here. If you go further down to Toscadero, the problem is there's no pesticides, but the water's all being drained off for agriculture. So you get situations like this, where there are 3,000 tadpoles and an inch of water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So high stress with no pesticides. And then you come further down, the water's bad. Foot and a half deep, 22 degrees, but it's 100% agriculture runoff. It's 100% water that runs off of our food. Yeah, your food. And so here's what that looks like on Google Earth. No stress, nice place to be a tadpole. Stress, but no pesticides, high temperatures, desiccation, crowding. And finally, when you get down here, no physical stress, but you see that's all farmland. All that water is running off of our food. Long story short, picture's worth a thousand words. I'm not going to show you all the data. This tadpole and this tadpole are the exact same age, collected from the same river, on the same day, same developmental stage, same species. The only difference is this tadpole is living upstream of the agriculture, and this tadpole, which has severely impaired immune function, is living downstream of water that runs off of our food. Now to give you again an idea where those frogs come from, they literally come from right under this little overpass in Salinas. And, and now I'm going to wax liberal arts, because you know, I went to a liberal arts school, and I'm going to tell you what Steinbeck had to say about and East of Eden about Salinas, that little place that we collected from. Steinbeck wrote, Salinas was surrounded and penetrated with swamps with two filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. He wrote, with the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and its sudden disappearance, as after a clap of thunder, was a shocking thing. It is possible that in the night the frog song should have stopped. Everyone in Salinas would have awakened feeling that there was a great noise. In their millions, the frog songs seem to have a beat and a cadence. And perhaps it is the ear's function to do this just as it is the eye's business to make stars clear. Here's what Selena sounds like now. The six years that I've been working there, I've heard a single native frog call on the Selena's River. And I love that passage because I think it's, I think it's, I think it's better than a piece of scientific. Because a literary artist recognized and felt that the frog song was such a part of the landscape that he spent a half a page writing about the frogs in their millions and their song. And now that's gone. I'm not going to tell you that. You heard earlier there should be some more lines. I'm not going to tell you they're gone because of anthony. I'm not going to tell you they're gone because of pesticides. But I'm going to tell you that I believe that the data show that chemical contaminants, and particularly endocrine disruptors, play a critical interactive role with other factors contributing to amphibian declines. Imagine an environment like one I just showed you, where there's a loss of habitat. And so now the only water that you can breathe in is agricultural runoff that's full of chemicals. Throw in there now climate change that's adding another stress. Throw in there now invasive species that are carrying diseases while you're living in water that's contaminated with a mixture of pesticides that lowers your immune function. And I think chemicals, chemical contaminants, Pesticides among them are playing a critical role, interactive role, in these adverse outcomes. I show this slide, actually, that I've been showing now for geez, more than 10 years, to express what I used to say the oneness of environmental health and public health. The water, for example, from this runoff from this crop, which goes in these containers, is the sole source of cooking and drinking water in this nearby village. This is Lake Nabugabo in Uganda. If I told the men that you know, fish and frogs in this water have eggs in their testes and pure immune function, and pure poor immune function, the connection of the oneness would be clear. On the other hand, here's my village. I live somewhere here. My water just comes from there, but we make these assumptions. Because we have this fancy EPA. We make these assumptions that because our water, for example, is E. coli free, that we don't have anything to worry about. I don't believe that that's the case. I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night, because in much of the same way that Richard Carson talked about the Silent Spring and the death of birds and the role that pesticides were playing, we're telling us something about ourselves. I think that our pending Silent Night and our Silent Night that's already here in some cases, is also telling us something about ourselves. Our new canary in the coal mine is telling us something when 70% of amphibian species worldwide are in decline, which is 40% are in danger threatened. A group of animals that, again, you just heard, that survive 
the extinction that took out the dinosaurs, and now 70% are in decline. A colleague of mine wrote an echo epidemiology, the occurrence of an association of more than one species, and species population is very strong evidence for causation. I've shown you more than correlation. I've shown you just few, a few of the data that show cause-effect relationships and controlled experiments of what atrazine and other pesticides can do. I've shown you that in more than one population, more than one species, more than one genera, but multiple families of frogs. What I'm going to tell you now is that similar data has been shown in fish for atrazine, reptiles and birds and mammals, including laboratory rodents, human cell lines, and epidemiology. I published a paper. It turns out scientists won't uh, really go and testify before the EPA, but if you ask them to go off the paper and put the name on it. So it's a paper where we, where we show that these effects of atrazine are consistent across vertebrate classes. This paper included 22 authors from 12 different countries. One of the other claims of family papers, I invented the word gonadotoxin. <laughs> Lord, they really don't like me to make up words. Lord, wrote me, no, that's not a word. You made it up. Don't all words start out as made up? Yeah. I, I read a paper in science, actually, that says that all language originated out of Africa. I'm just trying to represent and do what my people can do. For <laughs> so here's what we showed in this paper. And by the way, I didn't know any of these guys when we first started. So here's my frogs so with sperm and testes, you get atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy in Belgium, sperm and testes, give atrazine, no sperm. This is a couple in Argentina. I got to go visit them because they co-authored my paper. Put sperm in the, in the test. Uh, sorry, sperm in the testes, give them atrazine, no sperm. This is a caiman, kind of like a big, big alligator. These, this work was done in both Nigeria and Croatia. I got to go there and visit. This is a rat, testicular tubule, sperm in there, give it atrazine, no sperm. And this is a guy in Pakistan with quail, birds. Sperm in the testes, give it atrazine, no sperm. So, unlike the company said, it wasn't just me, crazy guy from Berkeley, oh, well, I'm crazy guy from Berkeley. But the science was good, it was being replicated in labs all around the world in every vertebrate class. What's more is my proposal that there's no sperm because testosterone is impacted by atrazine. That leads to the sperm production. This is a guy in England, he showed the same thing in fish, that's salmon. Here's my work. This work was done in rats by people who worked for the company. So it wasn't just me showing that atrazine causes your testosterone to go down, chemical castration, that's the way I like to call it. It wasn't just me. What's more is in humans, in 2003, my colleague Sean Swan showed, independent of me, that if you look at men in Columbia, Missouri, there's your p-value if you like them. If you have atrazine in your uh, urine, 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in your urine, you have low sperm count, can't get your wife pregnant. Correlation, just a correlation. But we show in every class of vertebrates, you give atrazine to animals in the lab and their sperm count goes down. They don't have sperm in their testes. Just a correlation. What's more is, watch my PowerPoint tree. Remember, these guys have enough atrazine in their urine. Same level that we used to give them to castrate frogs. Here's what fuel workers have in California. I'm going to squash it down again. Because here's what men who apply atrazine have in their urine. Men who apply atrazine have 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. Men who apply atrazine in California have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we know is associated with adverse effects on reproductive health in men in Columbia, Missouri. Men who apply atrazine in California have 24,000 times the atrazine that we use in the lab to chemically castrate frogs and fish. Men who apply atrazine in California have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we use to chemically castrate a frog. One of these guys can pee in a bucket, and I got diluted 24,000 times, and I can use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets with 30 tadpoles in their inch. We know nothing about the reproductive health of these men, because they're 90% Mexican, Mexican American. But we do know that they have life expectancies of 50. We do know that in addition to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was originally developed as a nerve gas. They're exposed to chemicals like 214, which was a component in Agent Orange. And so now what's happened is, a little boy who likes frogs is getting introduced to some pretty grown-up ideas, more and more grown-up words, environmental justice, environmental racism. See, I learned things like, in California, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. If California were its own country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the world. Because of agriculture, one in 10 jobs are in that. 30% of the land is in that. We produce 350 agricultural products. And this one blew me away. 50%, half of the US's food, 
half of the food that we eat in the United States, fruits, nuts, berries, dairy, vegetables, half comes from the United States, I'm sorry, from California. Half of the U.S. is food. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. And if I, if I on this map now, put in red, red always means bad in my slides. These are the top 10 counties for agriculture in California. So technically, about 30%. These are the counties that make California the fifth richest country in the world. These 10 counties. Where do you think the 30 poorest towns are in California? So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are the targets of chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes that we see in those same communities. So a little boy who likes frogs is getting a lot of other grown-up stuff to think about. Does that mean terminal aromatase, increase estrogen? I'm not going to talk to you about egg production because humans aren't going to make eggs in their testes. But aromatase is important for both breast cancer and mammary cancer. The top two cancers in humans behind lung cancer, cancer being the number one cause of death behind heart disease. With regards to prostate cancer, there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in men who work in their factories. Bag and atrazine in a community that's 80% African American, 80% black. I'll tell you why I break that up in a minute. On another note, at least one study in Kentucky shows that with a p value less than 0 0.00001, that women who live in an area where the drinking well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't use their well water for drinking. That's just a correlation, but I already told you with rats, there's a decrease in testosterone and a concomitant increase in estrogen. In addition in rats, and this work was done by the company, not by me, in addition in rats, when you're exposed to atrazine, there's an increase in the incidence of mammary tumors. So it's just a correlation in humans, but again, we can reproduce this in laboratory studies. What's more is we can take human cell lines, and we've published on this, but this is work that was produced by the company, peer-reviewed and published. If you take a cell line that doesn't normally make aromatase and estrogen, and give it atrazine, all of a sudden it starts expressing aromatase and making estrogen. Just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in birds, just like we've shown in laboratory rats. Now these are human cell lines. Why should they respond any differently? I went to visit them. Yoo-hoo! They wouldn't let me in. In part, because I keep telling them I think their name should be spelled with an I, not a Y. But that's just me. Spelling was never my forte. They have a pipe that runs right into the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico every year. In a community that I told you is 80% African American, much of it looks like this. There's a toxic tour you can go on in San Gabriel, Louisiana. And one of the things I learned on that tour is that these, what you're looking at here, these are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get in the United States. And red now are the ones that you're more likely to get, 11 of the 13, if you're black, if you're African American. Correct for socioeconomic status and access to health care, and I can show you similar data from Hispanics. Relative to white or Caucasian Americans, here's the ones you're more likely to die from if you're black, 13 out of 13. Is that a genetic difference? Is that a biological genetic difference? When the doctor tells you that you're more likely to get breast cancer if your sister, your aunt, or your mother, or somebody else in your family had it. Is that genetic? Or are you just telling you you've been exposed to the same crap that other people in your family were? Because if you're a minority, you're more likely to live in a place and work in a place where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. My colleagues who are actually legitimate cancer researchers tell me that only 10% of cancer is due to genetics. And while I'm all, I'm all down for colon for the cure, they invited me, they don't give me no money, but they invited me to give a talk once. I called it announcement prevention. They never invited me back. The issue is, if all the cancer cell lines that we're using, are for healing, to study cancer, if out of all those cell lines, none of them come from minorities, and this is true, the cure that you find may be relevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die from those diseases. But there's no money in finding prevention. There's only money in finding the cure. One of my graduate students showed that if you take a human cancer cell and give it atrazine, it starts expressing aromatase, increases aromatase expression. Now that's significant because, as you know, 70%, probably 100%, of breast cancer start out estrogen dependent. And that's an interesting finding because most women get breast cancer after menopause. However, we now know that cancer mostly depends on your lifetime exposure to estrogen. 
and also a local expression of aromatase where estrogen is made locally, even though it's not in the blood. That locally produced estrogen causes damaged cells to grow into the tumor. In fact, the role of locally expressed aromatase is so important in cancer that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical that decreases aromatase activity, decreases estrogen, so your damaged cells will grow. How much sense does that make when the number one contaminant of drinking water in the world does exactly the opposite? Turns on aromatase in every species that's been examined, increases estrogen, and promotes breast cancer grants and is associated with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to somebody because look, the Vardis Oncology offers treatments for cancer that range from breast cancer. So yeah, the same company that gives us 80 million pounds of aromatase inducer sells an aromatase blocker to treat breast cancer. So if you're living in the Midwest taking Novartis' letrozole to block aromatase in the year 2000, you're also drinking interactively, which induces aromatase. I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. <laughs> they like that so much. <laughs> so I think what's happened is I think that this little boy who likes frogs has learned a lot about this aquatic organism as well. Because I would argue that we're not all that different. We develop in an amniotic fluid, we depend on testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormones, glucocorticoids, just like my frogs, exact same structures. And I would argue that one of my, that a human fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid is not all that different than one of my tadpoles trapped in a contaminated aquarium or a contaminated pond. We now know that we're exposed, your children will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb most of which we have no idea what they do. That raises my concern because at least for atrazine, we already know that it causes prostate and every cancer rats. I can this. Somebody else published that. We already know in rats that atrazine causes immune failure, just like we showed in amphibians. We already know that atrazine in utero causes neural damage if you're exposed during development. Other people show that, not me. We already know that atrazine causes abortion because of the hormone balance it creates. And EPA laboratories showed that. Another EPA laboratory published a study showing that of those who asked to don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. Another lab, EPA laboratory showed that of those who asked to don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired memory development. That same laboratory showed that when those rats grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because they can't make enough milk to provide for their offspring. And it's this study, not my own study, that moved me to much more than just a little boy who likes frog. Because you see, this rat on the bottom, that rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. That rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. That rat never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrophy that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl starting her freshman year in college, when I think about the fact that my grandchildren, your grandchildren, could be affected by chemicals that we're using today, moves me in a way that's much bigger than just a little boy who likes frogs. The data are already out there. My colleague has shown that if you get pregnant doing peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have a child with birth defects. Of those birth defects, this particular study, which I believe came from Center for Disease Control, was published. Maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastric diseases. I apologize for the images. I didn't know what gastric disease was. One of my former students who's nearly now said that this it's when the baby's born with the intestines on the outside of the body. Another study showed that atrazine is highly correlated with coenal attrition. I didn't know what that was. It's when the oral and nasal cavity doesn't close up, so the baby's born with a hole in its face. Another study, and this one interests me more, showed that in a case control study of maternal resident resident atrazine, that exposure is associated with male genital malformations. I won't read it up to you, pictures worth a thousand words. If you are pregnant with a son and exposed to atrazine, you are more likely to have a baby with hypoglyphs babies but the urethra doesn't come all the way through the penis. You're more likely to have a male son with cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a baby with microphthalus, where the penis simply doesn't grow. And this one interests me more as reproductive endocrinologists, 
Because I know, we know, that the male genitalia depends on testosterone. And that estrogen, synthetic or real, can induce all of these effects. And if you're exposed to a chemical, if you're exposed to a chemical, if you're exposed to a chemical that decreases antigen and increases estrogen, you're more likely to get a malformation that we know is associated with decreased antigen and increased estrogen. Some say I crossed the line because I have a hate. I won't walk across the point. I was told, I love my advisor. Somebody else was advised by him. But I was told when I first got involved, he said, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. But I very quickly learned that this is maybe not the best advice. Syngenta has on their website, they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. One, pardon my language, but who said shit like that? <laughs> Two, the EPA said in 2006, regarding my work, they said this to the press, they said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science on whether or not to ban atrazine. They said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. They said it weighs in public opinion. You know what I thought about? I thought about my mom. The EPA is counting on my mom to have an opinion. And my mom can't get access to the places where I publish my work. That we in the Ivory Tower give all these kudos and promotions and raises for publishing in places that are inaccessible and then we criticize each other if we step out too much and talk to the public. But the EPA is waiting on my mom to tell it what to do. So I'm going to close on two quotes that now have a big impact on my life. They both come from intellectuals, philosophers, radical thinkers that I greatly respect. One is, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be a scientist and an advocate, if you have the I didn't start out privilege, but I did the hard work, but I have privilege now. I have a duty to act. For me, that means public presentations, documentations, helping litigators, helping regulators, helping uh, 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 legislators. That's how it's manifested with me. This brother said that, by the way. My second quote is that it's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's up to us to do what we got to do to survive. And this brother said that. <laughs>